Hi there, my name is Andy Croft and I'm a pastor at a church called Soul Survivor in Watford. Welcome to the programme God Speaks Today. On this programme what we do is we take a passage of scripture and we just listen to it. We, we allow God to speak into our lives for today. And there's a passage I'm going to come to later but the subject that we're going to be looking at today is the subject of peace. Someone came up to me the other week and they showed me their Apple Watch. They said that they just paid for something with their watch. I think it was a McDonald's or something like that. And they were absolutely buzzing. And uh, I, was, I was very excited for them. I couldn't afford one of those watches myself, but I thought it looks good. And we're living at a time where we have so much stuff in the West. We, have, we can pay for things with our phones. We, can, um, we get all these products that speed life up. So you can drink a Red Bull or you can drink a coffee to keep you going. We also have a whole load of products that slow life down. So you might have Radox bubble bath or some sort of spa treatment or something. But we have something for everything. And yet, even though that's the kind of culture and country that we are living in, we still lack something. There's something that's missing. And the something is peace. And as we, as we look around at the world, we see that so many of us, what we do is we live our, we live our lives in fear. There are different things that cause us to be afraid, uh, some of them more serious than others. One of the things that I am terrified of, and I have been from when it started to happen to me, there was a point when I was a teenager where I discovered that when I'd say hello to uh, women, they would now, rather than, when, you know, when you're a kid, they just say hi or whatever. But when you get to a certain age, they start to greet you in a particular way. So sometimes what I find is they come in and they want to hug you. Sometimes what they do is they want to kiss you on the cheek and they'll just go for like a one kiss on one cheek. And then other times they want to kiss you not on one cheek, but on both cheeks. And the reason this is something that I find frightening is because I never know what they're going to do when I see them approaching. And it feels like a game of rock, paper, scissors where it's like, this could be anything here. And it feels to me like I always lose. So I've had occasions, and maybe you can relate to this, where I've gone in to, to greet someone, and I think this lady looks like a hugger to me. I'll go in for a hug. I go in for a hug, and she's actually going for a one kiss. But because I've gone right in there to embrace her, she's not kissing me on my cheek, she is snogging my neck. There are other times I think this is a, this is a one kiss lady. So I'll go in for a one kiss. And I, I remember there have been occasions where I've gone in, you know, we've done the one kiss, and then I pull back because I think that's all that's gonna happen here. I pull back, meanwhile, she swings around for the other kiss. At that point, I realized, oh my word, she was going for two kisses. I better get my face back in there. I put my face back in, but she's realized in the meantime, he was just going for a one kiss. So she's pulled her face out. So then my face is just left hanging in front of her. Even when I get it right, even when I, like, it's a one kiss, so we go for one kiss. I've had times where this is a one kiss. Uh, this happened with one of my friend's mums. Um, I thought, she's going for a one kiss, I'll go for a one kiss. The problem was, I went right, and she also went right. And so I ended up kissing her, not on her lips, but on the bit of skin between the lip and the nose. Now, if you've ever tried kissing anyone on that, and then having a conversation afterwards, it's a little bit awkward. That's one thing that causes me to live my life in fear. But there are loads and loads of other things that for many of us, they're much more serious. And that what they do is, is they show us there's a deep lack of peace in our world. Let me just read you. These are a couple of statistics about the UK. Here's a few. Self-harm statistics for the UK show that we have one of the highest rates of self-harm in Europe, at 400 per 100,000 of the population. According to a survey by the Office of, Office of National Statistics, nearly one in five adults in the UK, so that's 20%, experience anxiety or depression. Nearly 80,000 children and young people suffer from severe depression, and over 8,000 of those are children under the age of 10. Suicide is the most common cause of death in men under the age of 35. And the stats vary every year, but the Good Samaritans usually put it at about 5,500 per year. Men under the age of 35 commit suicide. This is from a little while ago, but in 2007, 2008, around 420,000 individuals in Britain believed that they were experiencing work-related stress at a level that made them ill. It's estimated around one in 100 women between the ages of 15 and 30 has anorexia. One million people in the UK have been diagnosed with an eating disorder, including girls as young as seven. And that's just a few. We're living at a time where we've, we've got everything 
and yet we haven't found peace. And that's why this story, this scripture, really matters. So you can find it in Mark chapter 4. I'm going to read from verse 35. And it says this. That day when evening came, that's Jesus, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. On a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. And so you can kind of imagine that if you've ever been in a storm. But I remember I was driving one time between Watford and Cambridge. And as I was driving, this storm just came out of nowhere. And I was on a motorway. And I remember having to put the windscreen wipers on super fast because I couldn't see. So I, I slowed right down. I was going 40, 50 miles an hour. I remember there was this tree that had fallen on the motorway. So I had to swerve out of the way of this tree. And the thunder and the lightning was absolutely going crazy. There was one point, you know, when you feel like it's really close, where it just went boom, boom, above, above the roof of the car. And, I, and I, even though I was in the car by myself, I went, whoa, as I was driving along. And it was crazy. And I was there in a car with the radio on, with the heating on. 2,000 years ago, these guys are in a boat outside in the elements. And the storm comes up, and it's bashing them everywhere. And they're, 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 they're absolutely terrified. They're professional fishermen. They grew up next to this lake. So they know people die on this lake regularly. And they turn to Jesus. And at the moment where they are fearful for their lives, he is fast asleep on a cushion at the back. And can you imagine if, if you found yourself in a situation like that? Let's say you're in another car, and you're driving along. I don't know, like a steep mountain road. And it's one of those roads where there's a massive drop one side and it's snowing and you're driving and you are terrified because you can feel the car keeps kind of skidding and sliding and you're trying to control it and you're pumping the brake to try and keep things. And, and at, at that point you turn and you're there with your friend. And when you've got your, you're sweating, you, you feel like you need the toilet, like you, you, your pupils are dilating and you turn and they are conked out fast asleep in the passenger seat next to you. What would you do in that situation? You would, well, I would, You'd smack them around the head. You'd say, wake up, wake up. Can't you see that we are almost about to die? At least if you can't do it, at least panic with me. That's what I say. At least let's just scream together as we fall off the mountain rather than you just being there fast asleep. So the disciples, they turn to Jesus and they ask the first of what we're going to see are four questions that come up in this passage. And these four questions, when we get them, they lead us towards peace. They turn to him and they ask the first question. And this is the question I would have asked if I was in that position. They say, teacher, don't you care if we drown? And for lots of us, that's a question that we want to ask God when we see what is going on in our world, when we see some of the suffering that's happening. So we see what's going on uh, in Syria at the moment with the war and the, the consequences of that with the refugees. We see what's going on in other parts of the world, but also we see what's going on in our own lives. We see people who are dying of cancer. We see our friends whose parents are getting divorced. We experience bullying in our own lives. We go through pain in our own, in our own worlds. And when I'm in the middle of that, one of the first questions I, I have is, God, where are you? Don't you care? There are lots of people today who don't believe in God. Stephen Fry is one of them, who, who are coming out talking about this, saying, how can there be a God when there's so much suffering in the world? And when we follow God, we ask that question as well. It's just that we ask it to him, not about him. And so they turn to him and they say, don't you care? What have they missed? The thing the disciples have missed is that Jesus is right there in the boat with them. He's not doing anything. He's fast asleep at that particular point. But they've made a mistake. And what the mistake they've made is because they can't see him doing anything, they assume that he has abandoned them. Many of us do the same thing. When we can't see God moving to resolve our problems, to end our suffering, we assume that he's abandoned us. And what we've missed is he's right there in the boat with us. 
Think about it like this. Uh, let's say you decide you want to climb Mount Everest, even though you've never climbed a mountain in your life. And you say, right, to your mate, I'm going to climb Everest next week. And they say, are you sure that's a good idea? You're, um, you're not very fit. Uh, you've never been up a small hill. How are you going to climb Everest? But you say, no, I've decided. I'm set on it. I'm flying out to climb Everest. If at that point your friend said to you, OK, fine. You made your mind up. I can see that. In that case, I'm going to come with you. And then they came with you. And then you start climbing up the mountain. And let's say you're you know, a couple of weeks into the trek or something. And you're there in a snowstorm. And you wake up one night and you can feel the tents kind of getting buried by this massive snowstorm. And you get out of the tent and you start shoveling snow off it and you're working really hard. And your friend is still fast asleep in this tent. If at that point you turn to your friend as you're shoveling all this snow and you say to them, don't you care about me? Don't you care that we're going to get buried in this snowstorm? What have you missed? Of course, you miss the fact that they're there on the mountain in the first place. And if coming up Everest with you doesn't show you that they care, then you've missed something. And the disciples had done just that. They saw Jesus asleep. They assumed he didn't care. They missed the fact he was there in the first place. Let me give you another example. A friend of mine, he has a fish pond. And occasionally he goes away and I go around and I feed his fish for him. And they, they always run away from me, the fish. Now, even though I, all, all I do is bring them food, I chuck the food in and they go to the bottom of the pond and they're not interested. Let's say that I said to you one day, I really, really love fish. I mean, I'm seriously into fish and these fish keep running away from me. And so what I've decided to do is to have an operation. I am going to become a fish. How would you respond? You would say something like, are you sure, Andy, that that is a good idea? You say you're going to give up, you know, aren't you like a huge, I don't know, like a massive five foot eight? You're going to give up this enormous height that you have in order to become a tiny little fish? You would go on and you would say, Andy, don't you have an amazing memory? Can't you remember things from, I don't know, two or even three days ago? If you become a fish, you're not going to be able to remember anything from even three seconds ago. Do you want to give that up? And I said, no, I've done it. I've decided to do it. And then I did actually go through with it. You would, you would be baffled, but also the one thing you would not be able to doubt is that I really, really love those fish. Now, the idea of me becoming a goldfish is less ridiculous than the idea of the maker of heaven and earth becoming a person. And yet he chooses to do that. And so the first response of God to that question, don't you care, is surely looking at him right there in the middle of the storm right there as he dies on the cross. And it doesn't tell us why suffering happens, but it, tell us, it tells us what the answer can't be. And it can't be that he doesn't care. He's come to be with you in the midst of it. Don't mistake the fact that you can't see his hand for the fact that he's abandoned you. He never, ever will. And then Jesus turns to the storm and he says, quiet, be still. Whew, stops. And he asks them a question. And as well as our confronting God, it's always good to be confronted by God. And his first question to them is, why are you afraid? And wherever you're watching this, I honestly believe that's a question he wants to ask us. Why are you afraid? What is it that's scaring you? And we'll probably all have a different answer to that. I'm afraid, God, because I'm afraid of rejection. And it keeps happening to me. I'm afraid, God, because I just lost my job for the third time and I'm not sure I'm ever going to find one that I can, I can keep. I'm afraid, God, because my parents argue and I think they're going to get a divorce at some point. I'm afraid, God, because I don't really understand you and if I don't understand you, how can I follow you? I'm afraid because everyone else seems to be finding a purpose for their life and I, I can't seem to find mine. I'm afraid, God, because I have anxiety or I have depression and I don't think this is ever going to stop. I don't think this is ever going to come to an end. I'm afraid, God, because the waves are just too big and my boat is just too small and I think I'm going to drown. I'm afraid. Why are you afraid? And the next question he asks is a follow-up. Do you still not have any faith? It's another way of putting it. Is, you still don't trust me? And I don't think Jesus is cross with them. I think he's just asking, you still, after everything, you don't trust me? He asks that to me. He asks that to you. And our response sometimes is, yes, I do trust you today. Other times it's, well, if I'm really honest, I'm struggling today. 
even after everything I've seen you do, God, even after all your goodness, even though I believe your gospel, I still today, I'm just finding it hard to trust you. And then the disciples, when they've seen that Jesus has calmed the storm, they ask a final question. And understanding the answer to this final question helps us when we're afraid and it helps us when we don't trust. They turn to each other and they're even, even more scared than they were in the storm. And they say, who the heck is this guy? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Who is it that is in the boat? I saw this thing on the BBC a couple of weeks ago, and it was talking about how much water there is in the world. And uh, it was kind of comparing the oceans. It was talking about the oceans, really, and it said, if you were to take all the water in the oceans and you were to put it in a bathtub, how many bathtubs could you fill? And what it said was you could fill enough bathtubs that if you were to line them one after the other, kind of end to end, you would have enough bathtubs full of water to go from the earth to the sun and back again 81 million times. He also said, this guy, if you were to, he's obviously worked out on a calculator or something, but he said, if you were to pull the plug on the ocean, let's say you've got like a normal sinkhole on the, on the ocean floor, you pull the plug, how many years would it take for all the water in the oceans to drain out? And he said it would take 174 trillion years for all the water in the oceans to drain out of a normal plug. So it says in Isaiah chapter 40, that God can measure all the waters in the world in the hollow of his hand. And Jesus just turns to the wind, he turns to the waves and he says, stop. Who is in this boat? It's the one who is that powerful. And sometimes what we think, and this is a mistake I've made, is I will relax. I will trust God when I know what he's going to do. And another way of putting that is I will trust God when I know that I can control him and that I can predict everything he's going to do. It's never going to work like that with God. The reason we can trust him in every storm is because he's bigger than the storms. But the fact that he's bigger than the storms means we can never control him. He is unpredictable. He is uncontrollable. He is uncontainable. And there's a bit uh, that C.S. Lewis, he kind of captures this dynamic to who God is in one of his Narnia books. And in the story, there's this little girl called Jill. And she just arrives in Narnia and she's really, really thirsty. And she sees this river and she's desperate, desperate to go and get a drink from this river. But there's a lion. The lion represents Aslan. Well, he is Aslan. He represents Jesus in the storybooks. And he's lying on her side of the stream. So he's kind of blocking it from her. And then she has this little conversation with him. If you're thirsty, you may drink, said the lion. And Jill's afraid, and so she says, will you promise not to do anything to me if I come? I make no promises, the lion replied. Jill was so thirsty now that without noticing it, she had come a step nearer. Do you eat girls, she said. I have swallowed up girls and boys, women and men, kings and emperors, cities and realms, said the lion. It didn't say this as if it were boasting, nor as if it were sorry, nor as if it were angry. It just said it. I daren't come and drink, said Jill. Then you will die of thirst, said the lion. Oh dear, said Jill. That's not a good thing in Narnia either. Oh dear, said Jill, coming another step nearer. I suppose I must go and look for another stream then. There is no other stream, said the lion. If you could control God, he would not be strong enough to help you. There is no other stream, there is no other place to find true, deep, lasting peace than him. You can't buy it with your phone. You only find it in him. And this might sound like a theory, but it works out in real life. Let me tell you some of the things I'm afraid of. One of the things that I have always been afraid of is failing. In my head, I have always associated, for some reason, um, success and love. And so I think if I'm successful, then people will love me. And if I fail, therefore, then people won't. 
And that causes me at times to just panic and to need to be good at everything and, and to need to be able to control the pieces. And as, since I met Jesus when I was 16, he's been taking me on a journey with that to gradually, slowly help me. Almost, he's been, almost been picking my fingers off life one by one, just helping me release my life to him. And I remember there was a time when I was having to do a lot of talking and that's, this kind of stuff stresses me out. I, I, because I'm feeling like, oh my, if I don't do a good job, people aren't gonna think very much of me. It freaks me out. I was having to do a lot of that. And I remember I, was, I went for a walk on a beach one time, really stressed. And I, picked, I was picking these stones up and I was throwing them into the sea as hard as I could. And I was just sort of angry at God and say, I want to give my life to you, but I just can't seem to just lay it down. And I just bumped into this guy. Um, it was a Christian camp I was at. And he, he just said, can I pray for you? And he prayed for me, invited the Holy Spirit. And he just said to me, Andy, your problem is not that God is going to let you go. Your problem is that you won't let you go. You won't let go of control. You won't surrender. You won't just allow him to, to, to come in and to be in charge. And that for me has been a revelation. It doesn't mean it's become easier, but I see now my fear of failure, it stops me from surrendering to God so much. And what God does in his kindness is he draws, draws your life from you stage by stage. Another thing that's been really hard for me, um, and it certainly has caused me to have an awful lot of fear in the last little while, um, has been to do with my little baby boy. So Beth, my wife and I, we had a baby boy, our first child. Uh, he was born eight months ago and he's called Josiah. And I remember driving Beth to the hospital. Uh, we arrived at the hospital and he was born 25 minutes later. So it could have gone a lot worse, but it was amazing. So he was born, we were absolutely over the moon. We took him home and took him home on the Monday. And then on the Tuesday, the, the midwife, the community midwife came around to visit us. And she took a look at him and she said, there's something that doesn't look quite right there, the way that he's moving. And you might want to think about maybe taking him back to hospitals. So later on that day, uh, that night, actually, I found myself sitting in A&E with my wife, who was exhausted, and my little baby. And there was something wrong with him and we didn't know what it was. And um, they came and they took his blood sugar. And his blood sugar was really, really low, below what it should have been by a long way. And so they said, oh, we're going to keep him in transitional care. Keep, keep Beth overnight and um, uh, he'll probably be better in the morning because we'll just fill him full of food. And so I went home that night and it was incredibly lonely having the night before being with my little family. There I was by myself. Um, but I got up the next day and I was expecting Josiah to have really improved overnight as they fed him full of milk. And what happened is he deteriorated. So I remember calling my wife at about seven o'clock on, on uh, the, the morning of Wednesday, I think it was, driving to the hospital and she said, He's gone downhill and they've taken him from transitional care to special care and I'm still in transitional care, I'm just exhausted. So the drive to the hospital that morning um, was horrible. And I remember getting out of my car and rushing up to special care and they had this little incubator thing. And as I walked into these kind of white corridors, uh, I saw my little boy, tiny little thing with all these wires coming out of him in this little incubator. And he was there, he's doing really well now. Uh, but he was there for about a week and it was pretty much a roller coaster. Sometimes uh, we thought there was improvement, but three days, four days after we took him in, he was worse than he was when we took him in. So we also saw that deterioration. And I remember finding that an incredibly difficult time when my first question to God was, where are you? Don't you care, God, about this? And of course, he responded, what, what is it that's scaring you, Andy? Do you still not trust me? Remember, and this is the key bit, remember who I am. Remember what I can control. Now, you can't control me, but you just remember what I can control. You remember that I've come to be with you, even if it doesn't look like I'm doing much at the moment. And I began to remember at that time, and I had no place to turn but to the Bible. And I remember uh, opening it up almost randomly, and there was a psalm that I read, and it reminded me who this God is. And it says this, Psalm 103, starting in verse 1, says, Praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. Who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. Who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. And then a little later it says, for as high as the heavens are, above the earth. So great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, 
so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a, as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. If you're going to fear something, fear him. Because he is powerful, but he is wonderfully, wonderfully good. When it comes to peace, you want to know real, deep peace in a world that has everything but that? You find it in Jesus. He lives a life that on the surface doesn't look very peaceful. He's born with the stigma of illegitimacy. He's born in the back end of nowhere. Grew up in Nazareth, the wrong side of the tracks. Carpenter for a living. He starts a ministry, but he's opposed. He has 12 friends, and at the end, one betrays him. One denies ever knowing him. The rest have abandoned him. And then they put him to death on a cross. And do you know what the Bible calls him? It calls him the Prince of Peace. And when you bring these fears to him, when you bring these things that control us so often to him, what he does is he reminds you who he is. He reminds you that he is in control. And then he fills you with something you can never buy and you can never find anywhere. It's called the peace of God. It's his wholeness. And he wants you to have it. When I finish with a prayer, Lord Jesus, we say together, we're so sorry that we take our eyes sometimes away from the things that, that, that scare, away from you, God, and we put them on the things that scare us. We're sorry, Lord, that we focus so much on the wind and the waves and so little on you who holds all the water in the hollow of your hand. And we pray now in this moment that you would remind us of who you are, that you would remind us that you're in control and that you'd remind us that even if we don't see your hand, there is a sure and solid truth we can cling to and it's that you are with us. Amen. Thanks so much for joining us on God Speaks today. See you next time.